this is uh, Ofa Hoysala and we are from Fields of You. We are uh, here to talk about uh, structuring data from surveys and our learning from a case study that was done uh, of a slum survey that was conducted in 2010. So, so all of us here in this uh, 700 people group are uh, big on data, so that's an established fact. And uh, we are a group of people who love analyzing data and visualizing it and uh, showing what it means best in a given context. So uh, we thought maybe it would be interesting to see what data looks before it actually comes to this form. So we like to present the journey of data up to the point where it can be analyzed. So this is the structure we'll be following in uh, uh, today's presentation. I think we should take about 25 minutes and we'll take questions after that. So uh, before uh, all of this, some context I think is very important. Uh, most of us here, I think, live in cities, and the uh, urbanization has been really, really rapid. I mean, we've seen increase in traffic enormously in the last ten years. Increase in prices, both land and commodities, and increase in distances, and increase in almost increase change. And there's been a lot of flux in cities. But along with this, there's also been um, increase in poverty, and officially. Uh, the number of slums in Bangalore is said to be 770, but a lot of uh, NGOs, analysts, and even the ex BBMP commissioner thinks it's over a thousand. And why there is why is there such disparity in the number in the number itself? Is because uh, slums are very contentious in nature, and uh, uh, their contributions to the city and the city's contribution to them is a big fight. I mean. There's been a constant argument and tug of war happening on this very topic um, in lots of parts of the world. So, as researchers, we were interested in uh, what was uh, what is the city's contribution to these uh, settlements, where about 60% of our people live, and uh, what is uh, their contribution to the city. And in that uh, smaller chunk that we wanted to look at was the relationship between migrations, and I think in one of the talks they said about 200 to 300 million migrations happen all the time. And what is the relationship in between migrations, livelihoods of people, and uh, the mobility that is available? So uh, with any research question, you go deep into what already exists. How many people have studied this problem? What are uh, what are their findings? What, I mean, are, are we reinventing the wheel? So that's the first step any of us would take. So these are the surveys that already have been done. Uh, there is, uh, you can go through them. I will not uh, dwell, uh, jump into the details of each of these surveys, and we can discuss uh, details of this after this talk. Right? Why we didn't use them becomes the most important point, right? Uh, the existing formats in a lot of time, a lot of times are non-digital, especially in Karnataka slum clearance board. They were in stacks of books. I mean, they were piled high. They collected dust. People kept helmets on them. And, it's data and uh, as researchers with greedy, I mean any piece of information that you want about the question you're trying to solve, you really want to have that on hand because you don't want to have a missing link, right? So uh, we helped digitize this data and we found that uh, at two points, there were two data points, 94 and 2008, and in a lot of places both of them had the same numbers. For example, uh, number of Christian children that study in schools in 1994 was exactly same for one slum in 2008. And this happened in multiple variables, and this just didn't add up for us. So the integrity of data was not really great. And uh, the aggregation levels of these data, a lot of this data was is collected on the slum levels. Uh, people spoke to the slum leaders, or as uh, you pointed out in the morning, it's either the state level, the district level. So if you want to really aggregate data, it's missing. And the census data, which is quite aggregate, was not available to us at that point in time because it just got released in 2011 and uh, not available. A lot of times the exact data point that you're looking for is not available. That is, transport transportation availability in slums is not available. At least we did not find anybody who had extensive data on it at that point in time. And household level metadata, as I said, uh, census has it, but the, we had a 2000 data point, but we wanted something more recent because a lot of change has happened between 2000 and 2009. So we wanted something that is more recent. So I would like to give an overview of the survey now. Uh, 1,114 households were surveyed in 37 slums across Bangalore. 
the smallest slum was 50 uh, households and the largest was 5,000 households. So we tried covering both small slum and large. So uh, this is how we stratified the slums. We wanted uh, religion, uh, Hindu majority, Muslim majority, Christian majority slums. We wanted Canada majority, Canada speaking slums, Urdu speaking slums, and Tamil speaking slums. Uh, Core and periphery slums, that is uh, slums that are in the center of Bino versus slums that are cropping up at the edges, periphery uh, of the city, and across all four directions, north, west, east, south. And slums in planned localities such as Janagar or Corporation right in the bank in the center of Bangalore. <coughs> so, as I said, really small slums to be really large slums. And every tenth household was served, so, uh, surveyed, so about 10% you would say was the sample. Uh, I would also like to mention that uh, one degree of slums we did not uh, survey was the new, really newly formed slums that are cropping up here and there. That are called the Nella Badi slums, which means uh, renting land. Uh, there are a lot of private developers that give land for uh, really open land for small amounts of rent, where people come and set up their shacks. A uh, lot of new migrants are very, very skeptical of. Uh, talking to you because they don't want to talk to you because they think you're going to chase them away and uh, the developers if they find out you're talking to them they're scared you're going to declare you're one of the government and you're going to declare the land so they're really skeptical so these people survive under the cloak of invisibility because they're really vulnerable so we, we that bias does exist that we haven't surveyed they're really new slums so they're very well established so these are the themes of questions that we surveyed that is we had demographics the basic name age education level uh, Maximum status, employment, uh, previous employment, current employment, employment benefits, uh, self-employment, migration, where they came from, when, where, uh, water was extensively covered, as in where they got their water from, how much water, uh, how much did they pay for it, and things like that. And household data, what is the material for household, what are the services they access, uh, they have access to, uh, and a lot of other details in the household itself. Uh, loans, that is uh, where do they get their loans from, how much interest do they pay, what is, their, what is the time period of their loans. The assets they have, the aspirations, problems and health were uh, mostly qualitative data and uh, transport was also extensively covered. So uh, we come to one of the most interesting parts or most useful for us to talk about here is uh, on-ground data collection. So we had uh, we in this uh, in this particular uh, piece we require if you want to go into a slum you require people to know them you require to know somebody in the slum before you can go in and talk to them because otherwise they will not talk to you. So uh, we require partners who are familiar with these slums and the people in it. But despite knowing uh, partners, despite having partners who did know the slums uh, extensively, we had to go back to one of the slums because the slum leader refused to let us talk. There are such instances, so having such networks becomes really important. Uh, there were eight women surveyors, and uh, for us, the thing we really like to talk about is all of these women were from the slums. So uh, they knew the context well because they lived it. I wasn't, if I had gone there, I might have missed out a lot of questions. But the comfort level a person has in talking to you when they think you're one of them is different from someone from outside. So. That was the most interesting thing for us in this survey. And uh, because most respondents were women, and uh, since these were all women surveyors, they surveyed during the week, and uh, they couldn't get uh, men to talk because men were out at work, or we even couldn't get both both uh, family members working because there would be no one at home. So 80% uh, of the respondents were women. So the comfort level was really established when we the surveyors were also so uh, we have there was an extensive training period uh, given that uh, all of them were new to this we uh, had a questionnaire which was uh, which was a skeleton of uh, something that was done by the world life i mean we had to place a lot of questions and uh, suiting our purpose. Uh, they were they were trained in three to four sessions to negotiate with the questionnaire as to what how these questions were to be asked and what do they write down for each question uh, and after that, a pilot survey of 200 households was done, and they went out to about a couple of slums and they asked these questions. And the question is, uh, we went through the answers that came in, and uh, some of them did just didn't seem to fit, or uh, some questions were too personal, or some couldn't be negotiated properly, so we had to change the questionnaire. 
But the biggest learning we had in this process was data entry is an absolute must up to the pilot, given the cost of mistakes in this process. So what happens is, sometimes you have a question that you codify, right? And then you say one is uh, uh, yes, two is no, three is maybe, four is not maybe. If you get an answer, most of people, most of the people tell you something that is not in these four. Then what's the point of having a four? You have an extensively text-filled survey. So I think data entry and data formats also change a lot once you convert it into a digital form. So it becomes very important to digitize once you get the pilot on. And this was a question somebody raised and he proposed it off as to why no new technology, why we have arriving mobile phones and tablets. And the great medium, I think the human the space for human error is very little when you're using technology. I mean, that's but uh, it works really well when you have a few parameters and you have to end up. What's, uh, for example, in maternal health, you have weight, you have height, you have BP, you have uh, female health. <coughs> a few parameters that you want to update constantly, it would be really, really useful to have a mobile phone that someone can use and enter these parameters in the form. But when you have two or two questions, which more, a lot of which is text intensive, I don't think the mobile interface really works very well. So, which is why we chose the traditional route of using a hand paper survey. This is the longest part of any survey because uh, we're greedy, right? I mean, you spend a lot of time and effort in collecting the data and you don't want the data to be cut. You want to be able to glean every piece of what is available to you and you want to be able to verify. You want to be able to justify it when you make an obvious data. So, we live in a country where there are 18 different languages spoken and a lot more spoken around the, the country. And uh, English is not one of the major ones, especially if you're talking about a film story, you're not going to find a lot of English speakers. So uh, you're going to have someone know the local language really well. And uh, uh, the survey initially, the form skeleton was in English. So a person who was working on the research was someone who was very comfortable with English. That got converted, translated to Canada. And the survey was in Canada, and that got translated back into English. So you have three points where there are lots of details. For example, uh, because uh, this is something that I was asked to tell, that uh, there was one person on the research team who knew Canada and was in on the field who knew the research background really well, right? And he was the only person who was doing the translation and who got to pick what questions to put. And in this process, because there are not a lot of uh, people who knew Canada as well. A lot of questions got missed out. For example, we did not capture disability data. So you do miss out a lot of these things when you're translating. And uh, our favorite example is time for travel. Um, the question essentially was time for travel. The time you take to travel to work. So it was said time for travel. In Canada, it translates to prior to the Samaya. Time for travel, which means most people said 7 a.m. in the morning. Once we saw the answers, we really wished we could capture that data. In what time you leave to work, leave to work, you can do a wonderful traffic simulation to see why there are blockages in certain areas and things like that. But you realize that during these, there are very small nuances that you miss during translations, and I think that one needs to be extra careful when wording these uh, translated parts. So again, uh, we had a team uh, of about 12 to 13 people that was digitizing this data and they were again trained because we wanted to be able to go back to them and say, okay, where was the mistake that happened? And so there's a one-to-one -one connection as I said, we're very greedy about data. So we had, uh, we did not uh, give someone else, we did not outsource this process because we wanted to be able to go back to them. So we trained them because uh, we wanted them to understand why certain separators are required in certain cases. Um, the difference between not applicable, for example, are you educated? No. What class are you attending? That's a not applicable question. And another uh, space where uh, not answered, for example, somebody doesn't choose to answer or not, so it's not answered. And some answers are just not available, and it's blank. So we wanted them to be able to make their own distinction because that's an integral part of digitization. So yeah. You can't set data formats in stone when you build a survey. You can't say, I want people to say that water consumption is an illness. Period. A lot of these people have collected water in pots all their lives. So you're not going to, if you go ask them, 
how much water do you consume per month? They're now going to tell you I consume 15,540 liters. I mean, even a close aggregate, you're not going to find because they're going to say he consumes four bindigays a day, he gets water for 20 days. So that's something that is required. And uh, how far do you drive? How many of us would say, we, we would probably say I travel 100 meters to collect water. But a lot of people would say I travel 10 minutes to collect water. And when you're deciding formats, we need to keep metric perception in mind. How we perceive different metrics is different for different people. It's, uh, as we, the water example in this case, it's different for different people. So metric perception, I think, is very integral when you're deciding data formats. The greedy researcher is back here. Right? You want to check and verify every, as in, we have scores and scores of Excel sheets pointing out at problems in different parts during the survey. Okay, this person has entered five years instead of five months. Do I keep the data? This person has said uh, this as uh, five kgs instead of uh, five grams. So this, the the age of the baby is uh, seven months. What do I do? With it? Is it 0.7 years? Because the metric was in this way. And uh, having somebody on the research team who knows this data, right? Who knows the language context? Who knows the data formats? Who understands databases? is uh, I think idealistic but is also very important that uh, as uh, Lucy in her talk pointed out you need an intersection of all these different disciplines to be able to do this really well. So again how valid is your data? Uh, you might have excellent uniform looking data where people in one slum said all of us had the same problem. So you can say this slum has a problem let's go solve it. Is it true? Or do you go back to the survey and say, are you sure this is what happened? Or all people in the slum said they married at the same age. For example, uh, they married at 21 and 18 exactly, but the children were, they were married five years ago and their children were 10. So, is your data valid? Do you want to say, I will throw away this data? So, that's the discussion that you have to have very. Um, we are very greedy. We try to hold on to our data so carefully to say we are negotiating every single point to be able to keep that data with you. So how you want, what parameters you will keep, and these assumptions need to be stated when you're writing about it. I think these assumptions, even us as researchers, we forget down the line that we made these assumptions and we need to clear the data. So I think keeping a track of these changes and this is what this is the change I made becomes important because stating these assumptions after an analysis. Extremely true. So I hand it over to Oka. Right. Uh, can I be brief? Okay, great. Uh, I'm just going to give a very brief overview about uh, how we store all this data. We had close to 300,000 data points. Uh, as already mentioned, we had each household data in one Excel sheet. So we ended up having 1,114 Excel sheets. I mean, uh, Excel is great for a lot of things, but if we want to query across these things, if we want to query just one plum, it becomes a little painful. So uh, what we did, we uh, we decided we'll uh, develop a design a relational database for the same. And for simplicity's sake, we decided to use MySQL. Uh, there are great uh, clients for MySQL. They're very simple to use. It's, it's, uh, it's not simple just for computer scientists. It's simple for other people also to use. We had economists on our team. We had social scientists. We have people who survey the data. It's simple for all of them to use. Uh, one advantage we had was all of these people, the economists, social scientists, etc. They were familiar with SQL. They, they didn't really know the nuances of databases. They didn't know what normalization was. But they knew how to write a set of queries, which was great, which is why we could use MySQL. So um, after discussions with all of these people, all of uh, the very highly interdisciplinary team, we decided we'll uh, come up with the naming conventions for the tables. So what we did, we thought we'll say a uh, question number, underscore question name. Like for example, 55 was travel mode. So what we, the table for that was 55 underscore travel mode. Very simple. It was exactly the same as a questionnaire. So all you need to do was select star from the 55 underscore travel mode to get a list of all travel mode data. Uh, if, say for example, we had to store a set of questions in one table, it was question number on two from question name. So it became, uh, say for example, cycling data was 83 to 86. So 83 underscore 86 underscore cycling. So it was very simple for them to get as well. Um, when it comes to normalization, uh, this was something uh, a little different we tried to do. Uh, 
when we try to normalize it to more than three MX and BKMX, uh, became a little problematic because uh, from the feedback we got from all these people who did not know what normalization was, they could not understand why there was these extra columns, why there was these extra items. They did not get why it was insisted. So we have to have a balance between normalized data and easy to use schemas. So which is why uh, we ended up having most tables uh, in around 3 uh, but around one third of the tables is just 2 and sometimes even 1 and um, A lot of times we are asked, why this format at all? There are a lot of standards uh, to store data and to disseminate data. So why SEL? I think uh, one of the biggest advantages we have here is because of the naming convention we have used until this kind of simplified uh, schema we have, it becomes a great way to store data and also a great way to distribute data. In fact, the version that is online is an SQL file. It's very easy for people to just uh, put it back in MySQL and just query it. Right, so that was uh, about how we have stored data. Uh, back to our deep uh, score. So, data analysis, all of us here know what data is. So, uh, how are we analyzing this data? So, we just got the data cleaned up. We have it in almost full formats. So, it's underway. And um, one thing is, there were lots of partners that were involved. You know, we had the surveyors, we had the researchers, we had people who, people in the slums who gave us this information. So uh, I think all of us had vested interests because a lot of these people asked. But there are a lot of people who come and ask us these questions but don't do anything about it. So I think uh, we would want to, uh, we would try to change that in this process as to. Uh, even uh, some of the themes we included had uh, what the surveyors thought were most problematic, like water was extensively covered because the people in the slums had a huge problem, it was in the summer, right? So they wanted to know what was the problem with water and why they were having a problem with water. Now we need it, we don't have water. So it was very apparent that all of them had issues with water. I think that's one of the reasons why we extensively covered water. So the finale. You have a report and you wanted to impact like a policy or you want to write a paper in a journey, give a service. So that's our you know that. So you want to be able to write something and um, I think as I already mentioned, we want to first take this data back to uh, people uh, who gave us this data. That is the producers of this information should become the first consumers of this information for us. So I think we're trying to uh, find ways to engage with them actively and get feedback from them as to how valid the data is, how valid our analysis is, and how we can use, use it better. So, yeah, uh, we would like to acknowledge these people uh, on the board. And next slide. So, here are our mail IDs and our Twitter handles. Any questions at all?
thrive on the networks because they migrate to their relatives or they migrate to people they already know. So the only problem they didn't have living there was the fact that they felt safe. So that, according to me, was one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest uh, findings. And there were equal number of men and women in all schools at all ages. So uh, people, uh, I don't know, if it can be tipped both ways. But uh, there are equal, there were equal number of men and women in the Um, we went back to the slums to verify the data after a point in time because uh, it had been a year since we started data cleanup and we went back to them. Uh, as of now, it's a very extensive process. I mean, I, I think it took us two years and it's still in the process of cleaning this data. So we have no sustainable way for us to go and get time to these data back in there. It would be lovely and I think all of us have been talking about ways to set up mechanisms where people inside the slums themselves come forward and give the data. But I think the reason that that already does not work is because they don't get anything back. Maybe we need to find a model. Is the data public or uh, the data is public, the link is on the presentation. So uh, I think the presentation. Yes, no? Okay, sorry, no, no. I want to know what was the primary research question behind the starting question? Uh, yeah, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the primary research question was. Uh, what is, I mean, it's a very grand question. What is the contribution of the slums to the city and the city to the slums? So, I mean, it's probably, if we could find out, I think we would But we have no answer to it. It was uh, JDD Tata, the Jamshed Chief Tata Trust in uh, Punjab. Yeah? Was there any variation in findings? We are still analyzing the data. We, I can't answer this. Yeah. Um, I think there's nothing for the most common type. It depends on where they're located, and it's a very uh, where they're located and the work they do have a very uh, nice give and take relationship with each other. So it's a very place. So you have uh, places that are completely construction specific versus places that are all business specific and places that are all bargaining. So it means that you think really travel That's not true. Construction people travel a lot to work because the group might be constructing but they travel to the construction places. Yeah. Did you get a chance to find out, you said 80% of the respondents were women. Any chance? Did you get a chance to find out whether the responses of men were different from what? Yeah, so if we take the 20% sample, maybe we can try to see if the respondents of men were drastically different from the women and maybe then try. But uh, I think there is a slight bias in terms of the problems that they think about. I think a lot of them said they have been switched stop training. So I don't think you'll have the same response in the <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. Any questions? Please?